I don't know if you guys can hear it, but it's actually raining outside right now. Not sure if you can hear it, but I thought that right now would be the perfect time to read Planet Earth's Seast of Destruction, since the rain adds to the ambience. And also the real reason is because there was construction going on outside, and now that it's raining, they've stopped. I'm just going to go ahead and dive in to Chapter 4 of Planet Earth's Seast of Destruction, and this one does not have a title. Not sure why Chapter 1 and 2 didn't have titles, but Chapter 3 did. At least I think it was Chapter 3, wasn't it? Okay. Anyways, let's go ahead and start <clears throat> Chapter 4. Tony awoke to a beautiful sunny day in Kansas. Make <laughs> They all start off the same way. Uh, Tony awoke to a beautiful sunny day in Kansas, making breakfast for his wife Pam and his two kids, Sarah and Luther, getting them both ready for school. Pam was in the kitchen getting Sarah and Luther's lunches ready and packed for school, as Tony was warming up his big red truck to get... <laughs> as Tony was warming up his big red truck to get ready to drop them off at the bus stop. That sounds like something a kid would say, a just anyway uh just as tony was arriving at the bus stop a huge rumbling sound occurred along with massive shakes causing him to swerve to safety and avoid a house from collapsing on top of them tony told the kids i'm dropping you off at school today to ensure your safety <laughs> um after dropping the kids off at school tony then headed to the oil fields where he worked when he arrived, Tony met up with a few of his colleagues and mentioned the earthquake that had happened, and they all agreed it was out of the ordinary. Um, just as one of his friends was about to tell his story, it was already time to get to work. Just as lunch was about to end, another massive earthquake struck, this time breaking many oil pipelines, spewing oil everywhere, creating massive explosions. As the men ran... Trying to fix the situation, many lost their lives in doing so. Tony started running towards the men to aid them to safety. He has always been a very loving and caring man and will try to save anyone he can. On his way to helping people, he saw his close friend trapped underneath some metal debris. Tony yelled for his closest co-workers to help him lift the metal debris off his friend. Tony pulled his friend from the metal that was trapping him and carried him over his shoulder, running to safety just as the last explosion occurred. While Tony was approaching the rest of the workers that survived, he turned around to watch in agony the complete horrible and disturbing, shocking scene from the devastation that just occurred due to another earthquake. Watching as more explosions blew and fires started, nothing anyone could do but just watch. A few moments later, the fire trucks and ambulances started to arrive. Tony was standing there in complete shock, looking around, witnessing men on fire, dead bodies lying on the ground with smoke still coming off of them, wounded men being helped to the ambulances by the firemen and paramedics. Some men were severely injured, while others didn't have a scratch on them. Luckily, Tony was one of them. Was one of them. As the boss showed up, Tony gave his statement to the police. Tony's boss then told him to take the rest of the day off until further notice. Tony, in complete and utterly shock, <laughs> stumbled to his big red truck and sat there for a few moments to collect himself before heading back home. He turned on the radio and heard of a guy named Chris from somewhere in California had a plan and theory to fix the devastations occurring. As interesting as it was, Tony kept it on, listening while driving home, not thinking of anything else but the devastation that just occurred. As Tony explained to Pam what had just happened at work, he picked up the TV remote to show Pam about the guy Chris he heard on the radio station after the devastation. As soon as Tony turned the TV on, that's when they both witnessed, in shock, their children's school. So they didn't think to check on their children. <clears throat> they just went home, turned on the TV, and then realized, oh shit, our kids might be in danger. All right. Uh, 
their children's school. It was severely damaged by the earthquake, and they just didn't even... Oh, my God. Uh, the news explained that the earthquake shook down, took down power poles and all telephone lines. That's why they were unable to call for help and were unable to call the parents of the students to let them know of the devastation that just occurred. So I guess they didn't have cell phones. Oh, it said it took down... Well, no, it didn't say anything about cell phone towers. I don't know why I'm even looking that much into anything Chris is writing because it's obviously basically like one step above gibberish. Pam and Tony rush towards their big red truck, speeding... Why does he keep calling it that? Speeding past falling buildings while dodging cars and trees. Tony... <laughs> dodging trees while they're driving. Tony, with his big red truck, started racing through grass fields to reach the kids. Wow. As Pam tried to call, the kids never answered. So now she has a cell phone. Which, in turn, only put more stress and pressure on both Tony and Pam, making Tony drive faster than he thought he would ever have to go. Fearing their kids were not safe, Tony and Pam finally made it to the school, seeing the buildings collapsed. As they both hopped out the truck... They started frantically screaming for Luther and Sarah, but never heard a response back. To be continued in Chapter 6. Okay. I'm not sure why he added that at the end. I guess he's letting us know that that storyline comes back in Chapter 6. But I think he was doing that before. I don't know. Like I said, I need to stop analyzing what he's doing because it's all just shit all right i'm back i had to go ahead and make myself a cup of coffee because this was just absolutely putting me to sleep uh let me go ahead and read chapter five when sarah and luther got dropped off at school they started their day like any normal teenager would oh i imagine them as being like young kids i guess he didn't really tell us did he so I guess it makes sense that they had cell phones. Um, so I'm not sure why they couldn't call their parents. Uh, Sarah going to her group of friends and Luther sitting by his lonesome. While Luther was sitting by himself, a group of bullies began to pick on him, asking him for his lunch money and mocking the clothes he was wearing along with how he looked. I'm sorry, but this is so fucking hilarious because... Uh, you know, Uncle Adams would not be pleased with them. As this continued, Sarah noticed and immediately walked over to Luther and stood in between the bully and her brother. While looking at the bully, she said, Why don't you go pick on someone your own size? The bully then proceeded to make fun of Luther even more by saying, Oh, wow, Lucy, you have your sister here defending you. Show me Lucy. Shows me Lucy is a perfect nickname for a girl like you mocking Luther because his sister stood up for him. This seems really specific. Uh, Lucy, as for, I mean, did this happen to Crispy? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure it did, but, you know, there's no way he wasn't bullied in high school and middle school and elementary school. I guess it's kind of mean to make fun of his accent, but, you know, he's, he's just, anyway, uh, let me get back to the story. Luther quickly said, I am not a girl. I am a boy. In a gentle, high-pitched voice? Excuse me? Is this Chris B. making fun of gay people? Luther quickly said, I'm not a girl. I'm a boy. In a gentle, high-pitched voice. The bully then continued to laugh and mock both Sarah and Luther together. That's when Sarah knocked the bully on the ground with one clean punch to the face. The bully got up, held his face in his hand, and ran away scared while crying. Luther then said, Thank you, Sarah, for standing up to the bully for me. You know I am very shy and not a fighter or a problem starter at all. You have never stuck up for me like that before, and I really appreciate it. As Sarah turned to Luther, she said, Of course, even though you are the pain in my side, little brother, I will always have your back and love you. I am not going to let some punk bully and pick on my little brother some punk bully and pick on my little brother 
As she was talking to Luther, she noticed all of her friends were watching what she just did and started cheering her on. The bell rang, and siblings hugged one another. Then they both headed off to their first day, their first class of the day. And everybody clapped, of course. Both kids were in their class, Luther minding his own business in the back of the classroom reading a book, while Sarah sat on her desk goofing off talking with her friends. Sarah's teacher announced that the lesson was starting and for everyone to take their seats and begin and get ready to begin their day. Sarah's teacher then asked the children to open their history books to page 151 to begin reading for the day as there will be a quiz about that chapter later that week. Sarah, being the little troublemaker she is, started to pass notes and giggle with her friends who sat around her. The teacher noticed and casually asked Sarah, what is so funny? Would you mind sharing with the entire class? Sarah, embarrassed, replied, No, it's nothing. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. The teacher continued to say, If it happens again, then you will be sent straight to the principal's office. As Sarah straightened herself out, just the way he spelled straightened, um, as Sarah straightened herself out in her desk and began to do her schoolwork, there was a huge shaking that started to occur with rumbling sound accompanying it. The earthquake made the alarm sound off and the teacher quickly shouted, Everyone, under your desks! When the children got under their desks, the building started to collapse and tumble down as the earthquake was so strong. When the teacher was just about to tell the students to get out of the building quickly, a huge cement block came crashing down, hitting the side of the teacher's head, knocking them unconscious. The children all screamed in terror, staying under their desks. Sarah, not knowing what to do, looked around to see if her friends and teacher were okay, but it was clear they were not okay. You know, just one thing about this book is almost the entire thing is just, you know, earthquakes. So far, like, literally, we're in the, what, like, the fifth chapter of the book. That's all that's happened is earthquakes and action scenes. There's absolutely, and I'm not, nobody's surprised at this. It's not like I expected something different. But there's absolutely no, like, character development. There's not even any setting, you know. There's no exposition. They never set the story up. They never really, the only thing he ever explains is, you know, the color of the cars and, you know, sometimes, like, the clothes that each character puts on when they wake up. He doesn't give any exposition to how, like, any of them look, their relationships with each other, their ages, you know, anything whatsoever. So it's pretty much just they wake up, get ready, get in their red car, and then an earthquake happens. And the entire story is just him explaining, like, all of these people getting hit by stuff, falling over, dying. Like, that's it. That's the whole book. Oh, and, of course, the most important element is Crisby's theory that we need to pump oil back into the Earth to fix it. Because the whole Earth runs like an engine. Although, as someone informed me in the comments, um, Crisby does not know how an engine works at all. So, um, you know, this is just probably one of the most awful you know if someone i can honestly kind of imagine like maybe some like middle school student on amazon his mom's you know car it is uh default saved on there and he buys this book because he's like oh that's cool you know and he ends up reading this just <laughs> can you imagine i mean and imagine this you know he loves it this informs his um his taste I kind of hope that happens, but then again, I really don't want to wish that on anyone. Just, this is a real book. It was actually printed. That's sad. I feel like there should be some safeguards in place that stop trash like this ever getting printed. Um, I know I'm just rambling. I Like I said, I drank a coffee, so I'm just rambling, and I'm going to get back to this story. But uh, imagine if Uncle Adams wrote a book. I can't say that I don't hope that that happens in the future. While Luther was reading his book, Minding His Own Business, <clears throat> his teacher walked in and told the children they were going to be watching a movie today and to take extra notes because they will have a test at the end of the movie. During the movie, the TV quickly shut off. 
Seconds later, the rumbling and shaking began. Luther's class was able to run out was able to run out of the building just in time before it collapsed. He then thought of Sarah and ran towards her classroom, watching the building she should be in crumble to a big pile of pieces on the ground. Oh no. Luther noticed one door on the side was still intact, but the building just whatever, um, and tried opening the door. It was caught between two big chunks of cement, so he looked for the next entrance, which was a small window. It was still intact, so Luther found a big pipe on the ground from a sign that fell over and shattered the window, breaking it, making way into the building to ensure his sister's safety. Climbing his way into what once was his sister's classroom, he started screaming for her, Sarah! 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 It's Luther! Are you in there? Sorry, <laughs> I'm so annoying. Um, just as Luther was about to give up hope, he heard Sarah scream. I am in here, over by the corner, under the desk. As Luther made his way over to his sister, debris kept falling and crashing all around them. Pieces of the roof fell onto Sarah's desk, and Luther had to dodge the chunks of cement from falling onto him from the ceiling. As Luther got closer, he started to dig Sarah out of the barrier she managed to get herself in. Luther then realized there was a huge 2 by 4 that was holding the rest of the debris in the way, making him unable to lift out his sister. I'm surprised they figured out how to spell debris. Because, uh, you know, spell check probably isn't going to help you if, you're, if you don't know how to spell it at all. So I don't know how they figured that one out. Uh, in the way, making him unable to lift out his sister. Luther grabbed the pole he used to smash the window and pry it between the two-by-four. The concrete chunk miraculously moved just enough so that his sister Sarah was able to squeeze between the debris and get out safely. As Sarah and Luther were about to leave, Sarah looked back and said, Luther, we must go back and help the other kids that are stuck. My teacher got knocked unconscious and needs our help. Luther didn't even start to argue and continued with Sarah back to the pile of rubble that once was her classroom. They managed to help all the kids get out from the rubble and a group of them grabbed their teacher and they all got to safety, each one climbing through the small window Luther found in his search for his sister. Just as everyone was out of the building, it collapsed even more, making it no longer a building but a pile of nothing. All right, let me take... A sip of my coffee. I should probably edit this part out, but you know, I really don't want to go back and edit something like this. I don't want to spend my time listening to this again because reading reading this book that he's written and then going back and listening to it again, I feel like that would just completely like be the final straw that would send me spiraling into like another yet another meltdown of the day. So, I feel like that would just end my mental health completely. Like, I would just have none left. No sanity. So, uh, I really don't want to go back and edit this. I hate editing. Okay. Let me start chapter six. And after I finish chapter six, I'll upload this. Now, chapter six is the second chapter out of six chapters so far that has a subtitle. And the subtitle is continued from chapter four, dot, 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 dot. Just as Pam and Tony were losing all hope that their children were safe, they heard the screams of Luther and Sarah. We're over here, they shouted. As Tony and Pam came running towards them, Luther and Sarah both said, we are fine. We made it out just in time. The way he makes them talk is so unnatural. He doesn't use any um, contractions. Like, I'm not saying he needs to use slang, but he doesn't use any contractions. It's always like, we are fine. You know, like, he never says, like, we're fine, everything's okay. He's like, everything is okay. It just sounds so unnatural. And I feel like he does that because he thinks it makes them sound more professional. But it really doesn't. It just really highlights how bad he is at talking uh, and writing because the way he talks in real life sounds so unnatural as well. And not in the way that this does. He doesn't sound formal, but 
the way he talks is, you know, like he has a poor grasp on the English language in general, really. Um, you know, he's almost like he's basically like Uncle Adams, but just like downgraded to even further than you thought a human being could go. <laughs> because Uncle Adams is bad enough, but he's just he's even worse. And they're both delusional. I just don't. You know, I, I don't know. I kind of think Uncle Adams has been doing good recently. He hasn't really put out any content, which probably means that he's doing better than he was before. Because didn't people say he got a job? <clears throat> I think he probably has a job, and that's why he hasn't put anything out. Because, um, yeah, because people said that. Well, anyway, let me get back to the story here. Uh <laughs> Sarah told the story of how Luther came to save her and her classmates, and the risk he took to save them all. Without him, they would have all been dead. Everyone thanked Luther as the children's parents arrived. They all personally thanked him as well. As the teacher pulled through and woke up, they said to Luther, so she got hit on the head with a block of concrete and was passed out. They always do that in movies, though, like somebody will get hit on the head and they just lay on the ground like unconscious for like 30 minutes or an hour. Like, that's not how it works in real life, I don't think. But I, then again, I don't really know. Um, the teacher said to Luther, Thank you so much for your bravery and for saving my life. As I overheard you guys talking about what had happened, I would not be here if it wasn't for you. <clears throat> Sorry. Everyone called Luther a hero as they all left. See, that's what... Okay, I promise I'm going to stop interjecting here, but that's just constantly what he's putting in here is his fantasy, you know, like of people being like, oh my God, you're such a hero. You're so amazing. Clap, clap, clap. Let's give you a million dollars. That's literally his fantasy. He just wants everyone to call him amazing, hail him as a hero, give him money. He's famous. Like, oh God, just what, what a delusional, just all around awful person, really. Tony and Pam told the kids, we need to leave and find this man named Chris. He knows what is going on with the planet and why the earthquakes and devastations are happening, along with how to resolve it. Explaining to the children in the most calm and understandable manner, since they are only teenagers. Yeah, because no adult, you know, no kids could understand his complex theory. Um... <laughs> Huh. Okay, we are going to drop you both off at Grandma and Grandpa's house so you are safe while we embark on this journey. See what I mean? He's trying to sound intellectual while we while we embark on this journey. Okay, I promise I'm, I'm done interjecting because I know you guys want to hear the story, but I just cannot help myself. It's so goddamn ridiculous. Oh, I'm not supposed to curse on YouTube, am I? Oh, well, I'm not monetized anyway, obviously. Uh, anyway, Luther angrily said, No, I am not going anywhere without you guys. Sarah agreed. No, Mom, we are staying with you. We are not going to split up. We are all in this together and need to be close to each other. After all four of them argued over the situation, Tony and Pam finally came to an agreement and said, Fine, we will stick together then. They began to embark on their journey um, together to go find Chris and figure out what the can all do to stop this devastation on planet earth i'm sure he meant they um i'm not sure why these random people are just going to find him you know what i mean like there's i don't know at least the oil guy like he had money to invest but these are just like a random couple with a big red truck and two kids like in the middle of nowhere in another state and they see this guy on the tv that's supposedly like i mean i would assume famous at this point since he's fixing the planet as they were driving down the road in the big red truck, they were listening to Chris on the radio and his theory about needing to pump the oil that we took out and stole back into the planet to fix the problems, to re-lubricate the fault lines so the planet can slowly replenish itself. While they were all eagerly listening to one another speak about Chris and his theory, tragedy struck around them, buildings falling and collapsing. They watched as people were running by falling into sinkholes. People began looting stores and going crazy. Chaos broke loose out on the streets. As Tony was not paying attention, looking around watching people, a huge cement building fell onto the hood of the big red truck, creating a crash causing Tony to slide out, hitting a power line that was hot, trapping him and his family inside of the truck. 
Tony proceeded to rapidly try putting the truck in reverse, but ended up burning out, creating another scene, only this time causing him, Pam, and the children to get banged up and scratched, setting the airbags off, hitting them in all directions. Just as the power pole started to spark, igniting a fire under the truck, Tony managed to cut his seatbelt with his pocket knife and escape through the back window, being able to help his children escape. Just as he went to grab his wife Pam, he noticed her door was stuck and she could not move as she was severely injured. The dashboard of the truck was so caved in, it was trapping her legs, making her unable to move, no matter what she did. As the flames progressed through the front and to the front end of the vehicle, Tony knew in that moment he could not save his wife. When Pam looked at Tony, he knew what she was about to say. My arms are broken. I can't feel my legs. You have to go and save our kids. Take care of this planet. Don't let my death be made in vain. Do something powerful and meaningful to change the earth around for our children to have a better place to live and raise their children and children's children. Tony yelled, no, I will not leave you behind, just as he was just as he was telling her no and trying to pull her out, the vehicle started spewing gas, creating a fire too so intense, not allowing Tony to say goodbye and his last words to his wife, Pam. Luther and Sarah pulled their dad from the back window, jumping off the bed of the truck, just as it exploded the moment their feet hit the ground. Screaming and crying, all three of them devastated that their mo mother and wife was now gone. Luther and Sarah grab each other. Uh, uh, Luther and Sarah grab each hand of their dad and said, "Let's go, Dad. We need to fulfill Mom's wishes and find Chris to fix this planet once and for all." Tony and the kids continued walking and came across a running vehicle out in the middle of the street with no one around. Um, as they got into the vehicle, a grocery store owner began to fire shots at a burglar who was trying to rob his store. Tony then slammed the car into drive, flooring the gas while dodging the flying bullets in the air. He, he was probably uh, trying to stop them from stealing his fucking car. Um, starting the journey towards Chris. All right, we're a little over halfway done with the book. I'm going to upload this now, and I'm not going to promise... You know, when I'm going to upload the next episode, I mean, it's either going to be tonight or tomorrow, but every time I say, you know, oh, I'll upload it tonight, then, well, I guess that was only one time, but something happens, it makes it difficult, so I'm just going to say, um, I'll probably upload it tonight or tomorrow. Um, it, it, it looks like we're about halfway done with the book, if you look at the pages, but honestly, I'm pretty sure that it's more than halfway done. So I should either finish it in the next episode or the next two. Oh, one thing I wanted to say at the end of this before I um, upload the episode or whatever this is, the chapters, um, is that I have been looking. I, I really would like to do a true crime podcast. So if there's anyone out there that enjoys um, speaking and uh, is into true crime... I am looking for someone who would like to collaborate on a true crime podcast with me. Um, essentially, what I want is I would go ahead and write a script, you know, about a case. And I would tell this story to a person, you know, who would basically listen and, you know, just give their opinions on the case. Basically, just respond to what I'm telling them. You know, like I'm telling you a story and you're saying, oh, wow, like, that's crazy. So did they get away? You know, essentially. And, of course, give their opinion on what they think should have happened, what they think might have happened, uh, stuff like that. So um, I'm really looking for someone who, you know, would like to do this for more than one episode. But um, I'm not opposed to somebody that just wants to go ahead and do it for an episode, you know, provided I could go ahead and find other people. Anyway, that's not your problem. Basically, what, I, what I'm saying is if you would enjoy making a podcast, if you'd enjoy listening to me tell you a uh, true crime story and responding to it, then either comment down below on the YouTube video or message me on Facebook if you're finding this in the Uncle Adam's original posting group. 
um, and just let me know that you're interested and we can go ahead and talk about it. All right, so I'll go ahead and read chapter seven um, either later tonight or tomorrow and I'll get it out to you probably tomorrow, honestly. But like I said, I don't want to make promises just in case um, it doesn't end up happening. I know that they are doing a live reading today. So um, if you... That basically, I guess what this is for is if you want to go back and listen to it or if you missed the live reading. I don't know if they're going to screen record it or not. Uh, anyway, that's already enough talking. I'm at 30 fucking minutes and still not done with the story here. Um, so this is uh, this is running way over time. Anyways, I will talk to you guys later. All right. Bye.